today on 1% Better. I don't know if people do this, but that's something I want to study simply because I'm interested in it. I'm curious <laughs> as to why people do what they do, why they think how they think, but it's not something I want to do for a living. I'm laughing, and I apologize. For no, please. Thought there. I'm, I'm laughing because you said, you asked, I'm not sure if that's what people do. And in a sense, that's the purest form of why we should study something. This is the show dedicated to helping you improve your mindset, language, and behavior. Inspiring stories, practical advice, and damn good conversations. Here's your host, Joe Ferraro. Hello and welcome to One Percent Better. Episode 300 is here. No more excuses, no more waiting, no more searching for perfection. It's launch time. Thank you so much for being here. Some of you are crazy enough to have been here since July 1st, 2017. Some of you even earlier than that on a previous podcast with our good friend, Kevin. Thank you, Kevin, for the push out of the nest. Thanks to so many of you who have made this possible. Before we get any further, did you push pause? Did you notice the new cover art? Or was it like that person who shaves their mustache or beard, cuts their hair, and you don't notice for three weeks? Take a moment and look at the absolutely electric cover art that I invested in. Some of you are about to launch a creative project, and you say to yourself, it's got to be perfect. I have to have great cover art. I heard one person say, thank goodness your old cover art is gone. And the other person then comes in and says, man, that was great cover art. I miss it. So you can't please everyone, but you can make intentional choices that make you happy. The creator has to be happy. Rick Rubin has said that multiple times. Do what you think is best. Create what you like the most. And somewhere along the line, people will listen, and you guys have. It means so much. Thank you, thank you, thank you. 300 episodes deep. What has changed? What has stayed the same? Briefly, quickly, what has changed? A coaching business has evolved from this podcast, and if I can help you, you know where to find me, Joe at 1percentbetterproject.com or hit the link in the show notes. I have three clients right now, might have room for a fourth when one of the engagements ends. I have a CEO in the health and wellness space who trusts me to help her get ready for a panel at a major conference that is awesome. A duo who is touring the country right now giving keynote presentations. They want to sharpen those up. And I continue a longer engagement with a business director who is getting sharper and sharper with sales pitches, internal communication, et cetera. It's been great. If any of that sounds like you, I'd love to hear from you. What has not changed is how I approach these conversations. Without the podcast, nobody would even be able to connect with me. And when you press publish and you hit send, great things happen. Today's conversation exemplifies everything I believe in. I approached today's conversation, and by now you may know who my guest is, in the exact same way I've approached all of the rest. Rigorous preparation, endless curiosity, and I did not interview my subject today as if he was my son. I tried to interview Joey like he was a guest on the show, which meant, what makes him tick? How does he see the world? What habits and perspective does he bring that my next guest will not? Not better, not worse, just different, and trying to capture what people do in the worlds of mindset, language, and behavior individually. Highlight them, put them on a platform, get inside their mind, and that's exactly what I did here. When you interview a family member, like you're about to hear, it brings up all kinds of emotions. You'll hear me check in with him throughout the conversation. I ran this conversation by my beautiful wife, Dana. Uh, I told my father to get some perspective on how to do it, my dad being the guest on episode 150. And I'll never know if it was the right thing to hit publish on this. In some ways, this is the most intimate conversation I've ever recorded. And you'll get a chance to get inside uh, our relationship and to some degree, my family life. So as you have all along the way, I ask for your compassion, and your empathy, and your kindness, and your curiosity. 
don't be afraid to ask me questions and challenge me on some of the things I asked or didn't ask. And I think you'll find out rather quickly in this conversation, and I don't want to say too much, this was not a stunt. This was not a softball. You're going to hear from a young man who has done a lot of thinking, and I think he's going to bring a unique perspective on my work, on the community of 1% Better. But, and I don't say this lightly, he holds his own. This is a conversation with a young man who knows how to communicate and a young man who, simply put, could not possibly make his family more proud than we are today. Cheers to many more damn good conversations and many more years of getting 1% better. Brings me a great deal of pleasure and honor to introduce to you my son, Joey Ferraro. My guest today on episode 300 is the result of a simple question that I asked myself. Driving, while procrastinating, while searching for perfection, while thinking of the ideal scenario, celebrity, someone I know, someone I've interviewed before, what it all came down to was this. Who do I want to talk to? Who do I want to share and record a conversation with? Who is someone that every time I have a conversation with them, it brings me joy. And when I asked those questions, it was like this, an unlock. That brings my guest in for episode 300, my son, Joey Ferraro. Fellow Joe, it is great to be here. And I can't tell you how much those words mean to me. I have enjoyed our conversations throughout the summer and now the beginning of fall and my life so much. They've been really a highlight. So I'm glad we can celebrate that for an hour here. And just for the record, I have your permission to put this down as a 14-year-old time capsule. It may be heard by your friends. It may be heard by your teachers. You never know now. Oh. There's a joke there, but it's also serious. You never know when you record a piece of audio how far it travels. So how do you feel about that? I've thought about it, and I'm ready. I've, I've honestly felt like it could be cool if any of my friends ever discover this and they see me on here. And I'm fine with people seeing it online. I'm not concerned about giving away too much. You know, I'll keep my secrets close. <laughs> For those that are regular listeners, they will remember this is not your first appearance on the podcast. They'll remember better than me. <laughs> what do you remember about your first appearance? Nothing. I have. I know that it happened, but if there didn't exist a recorded recollection of it, I would have no memory. Episode 66, you introduced Seth Godin. It was my method at that point of coping with some new success wow. or notoriety. I, I thought because he was my dream guest at that point in time, I thought if you did the intro, it would lessen the stakes and it would help me take myself less seriously and it would be something super memorable as I, I hit a landmark. And I, I think you were seven years old. Wow, seven years ago. <laughs> I'm dub I've doubled. <laughs> you have, and I, and I think where I want to start is right where we are physically recording, in our basement, not to ruin the illusion for people, but <laughs> it's not a fancy podcast studio. You have uh, a blanket and you have a water and I have a clipboard. And Yeah, we're comfortable. But there's clutter. And yes, indeed. And there's, there's microphones that are tangled and there's testing and maybe the headphones could have worked differently. And yet mm. we're building a conversation that no doubt will impact people, inspire people, and certainly in a math sense, one plus one will equal three for you and me. What does that make you think about when you factor in going about our daily lives in search for optimal, in search for perfection, in search for the best, even a show called 1% Better? Sometimes it can be very instructive and sometimes it can be something that gets in the way. I want you to just be able to free, freestyle on that question of how this setting, how this moment makes you think about perfection and searching for optimal conditions. Wow. That's really interesting. Lately, I've certainly been made aware of my tendencies to over-optimize things. This is an example of a situation where not everything is completely streamlined, but like it all works. We're sitting here together and we're about to put our thoughts out into the world and there's nothing else that needs to happen. We could be surrounded by padded walls with intricate designs to promote sound distribution but we're doing fine just the way we are and just talking about the conversation and getting it out there 
we we have so many interesting and hopefully helpful conversations. So it's nice to finally put that to use out into the world. Mm. Recording this in late September 2024, you are the person I had the most conversations with this past summer. Wow. And in taking a hiatus from the podcast, it made so much sense to come back and, and talk to you. Now, people listening at home will immediately be impressed by your diction and your word choice. And those that know you will wonder the same thing I'm wondering. I've never had a chance to really ask you about this. To what extent do you feel like a kid and to what extent do you feel like an adult as you're in your ninth grade entered high school year? Huh. I like that question a lot. I've pondered various thoughts related to it. I feel like, maybe I feel like an adult mind in a kid's body. I don't want to be presumptuous, like tooting my own horn, but I have a lot of adult-like tendencies. I, I enjoy talking to adults very much. I enjoy spending time with them and... I don't always crave the the things that other kids enjoy versus what adults might enjoy. I this is tough. What where do you trace your origin story when you think back to that happening? Where 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 does that come from? Man. That's a great question. I'm going to say it could have something to do with the amount of time I spend with my family and enjoy it. I've come to just possibly take on some of the things that you and our mom and my mom likes. Also, I've done a lot of inside thinking. I've, I've thought a lot about myself. I've thought about my thoughts. A lot of, I think it's introspective. Just kind of considering like what my needs, my wants, my likes, my dislikes. I do a lot of considering like that. And I guess when you think about it that much, you start to go against some norms. You start to fall out of traditional categories of perhaps more kid-like. And what would your reaction be if someone told you that's not what the typical 14-year-old does? I wouldn't be surprised. In fact, I, I know pretty much already. A lot of the things I do, my buddy, I wouldn't call up. I don't, <laughs> my friend, I wouldn't call up and find them doing the same. But... That doesn't bother me at all. We sh I don't think we should judge what we do based on what is done. Yeah, but conformity is a very real thing in the teenage years. Being different can be perceived as weird. And some of the things you do are incredibly positive for the local community, the family community, maybe even through mm -hmm. a conversation like this, a community at large. But it's, it's far from the norm. Um, and sometimes I look at myself, and perhaps this is where, uh, where I'm, I'm thinking about, as a parental figure and also what I would call a friend and a mentor and certainly a mentee to some degree from you, I would think about my role in who you've become so far, nature mm -hmm. versus nurture on a daily basis where you've listened to so many of my ideas. Um, I, I guess I'm worried sometimes and not looking for anything but honesty like, do you think that at some places I've pushed too far in one direction for you to think a certain way? Or I just want to be mindful of who your identity is, not trying to be close to my identity. Dang, that's certainly important, individuality. But I've never felt forced to think about these things. It's not, I don't think it's as though you're imposing a personality on me. Someone Heart. says, Joey's a mini me. Is that is that if someone if someone says that, what would your reaction be? I have heard it. Wow. Well, I've heard it in I've heard it as well in like looks comparison. I've never thought about it in personality. I honestly would be flattered because you're an individual that I love to spend time with and I enjoy who you are and I enjoy how we've shaped each other. Hmm. That said, I don't believe that my interests have come solely from the influence that you've had on me. I guess that's refreshing because if I were to look back to a 20 year old Joe Ferraro, I would have said right. my son's going to be a future baseball player. That was my obsession. I played division one baseball. I went as far as I could. I thought about it all the time, all the ways that I try to help people with communication. I thought about getting edges in baseball and then in baseball coaching. 
and then you played baseball for I think two yeah, and a I half years. Yeah, I did not take on that hobby. I remember distinctly sitting in the drive-through of a Dunkin' Donuts, and you asked me if I wanted to. I was maybe five, six, maybe younger. You asked me if I wanted to play another season of Little League. And I responded, sure, why not? And I remember regretting it throughout the season. <laughs> How quickly did you regret it after saying it as you were about to get a bagel? Probably my next game. I didn't really think about it until then. I know for sure you didn't play beyond seven years old, but mm-hmm. my memory story is somewhere between five and seven. And I never knew. Did we start you too early or was the game just not for you? Did you ever give that any thought? Hmm. No, I've never. And I wonder what would have happened if you waited if anything, you need to start early to cultivate a certain love for it. Like if I was going to get to a four out of four on baseball, I needed to have the groundwork. But it just didn't take hold. So I don't think it would have taken hold better if we waited. And people who know me best, they'll, they'll say, oh, is your, if they've lost Tusk or something with me, they'll say, does your son play baseball? I said, no, he played for a little while. He's into other things. And mm-hmm. I can honestly say that's probably been one of the biggest blessings of our relationship. <laughs> Blessings, how so? Your your grandfather, who was the guest on episode 150, we bonded through food and baseball, right? We had basically two things that, mm. you know, comprised all of our conversations. For, for parlor game purposes and fun, here's some of the things you and I have talked about. Uh, I'll go one, you go one. So we've talked about food. Okay. We've talked about psychology, people. Logical fallacies. That's a great one. Tomato growing. Traveling. You're quicker than I am. Well, I've thought about this a long time. Aww. I can go on. Uh, we, we try to optimize how to make a steak on the grill, mm-hmm. which how is still food. food. It does. Yeah, I guess broad categories. But I guess the more important thing than the categories is possibly the depth and breadth. I never know what that word means with the D. Interesting. Yeah. <laughs> that we go into things. So like when we made pork chops the other day on the grill, we were using a technique that you and I had studied. Mm-hmm. About how to get more my my lard on it. I don't my yard. I don't my know. Yard, to, I believe. Yeah. but we're the, up to interpretation. That caramelization on there. Like we talked yeah. at that Crust. level depth. We we would we would talk about the hot hand fallacy and and then try to connect yeah. it to Charlie's soccer streaks. Oh my gosh! And there's probably a hundred other things we've talked about. I mean, maybe they fall 100%. into a few buckets. Yeah. Um, the intricacies are hard to list. But then you've gone on your own. You, you've done something to a degree at 14 years old that, that I've never done, which is baking. And at the time of this conversation, that seemed to have your imagination. You went from a lot of animation, a lot of drawing, to something that you still do, at mm-hmm. least from my vantage point. But it's the baking that has really captured you and who you are today. Would, would that be a fair comparison? That's, yes, that has most certainly encapsulated my interest and activities over the last few months of my life. And what is it for people who everyone listening has baked something, but you have taken on another life of its own in my view? Mm -hmm. What is it about baking that has captured your imagination? Well, I think the gateway here for a lot of us bakers are I love desserts. I really love celebrating with sweet treats that were made meticulously with love and creativity in every bite. I suppose. And I wanted to figure out how to make the things that I love on my own. But nobody that I know does that though. They don't say, "Well, I have a great cook and baker in my in my mom. I have a great cook in my dad and we have access to different things in in, in Fairfield County." But n- instead, I'm going to dive in. And then you've you've read books about it. You've read articles about it. You've researched how to make the best chocolate chip cookie. That that will sound familiar to people who know me, and it will almost sound like a lot of my traits, but represented in baking. And I don't want it to oh. represent me. I want it to represent you. And I think I there's... I never thought... No offense. I never thought about it as representing you. Yeah. That's good. That's mm-hmm. that's what I want. <laughs> I mean, obviously, early in this conversation, I feel like I'm, I'm trying to defend myself to, to allow oh. you to have your own identity but it's just i'm looking across from you and looking at someone who mom and i are just incredibly proud of and a lot of times people will will see some of your behaviors or traits and think that it's surreal or something that is very atypical and i wonder to what extent you're aware of that i'm certainly aware of it i don't i wouldn't say it goes as far as we might be making it out to be but i also think 
I'm in a good generation to have different interests. Meaning? We've done, a, we've, the world has come a lot of, a long way with the word weird and unique and different. And again, while I wouldn't say it's as far as your average Netflix movie, I think it's a lot easier to be weird and a lot more well-received. Not that that matters, but it's a lot more well-received nowadays. And just for people specifically, talk about your latest uh, chocolate chip update. Ooh. Can we move back a little before I explain the intricacies? Sure. I'll go into more the why of what brought me here. I, it started with cooking because I love food as well. I love almost as, as much as I love desserts. You can't really ask me to pick a pick one, cooking or baking. So I started experimenting in the kitchen, and that's just what it is about both of them, baking and cooking. So much experimentation. Not only do you get an insane destination, you arrive at something you curated to exactly your liking, and you can make it taste and feel however you would like it best and share it with people too. The destination is insanely enjoyable. The journey too. It's the experimentation that's more than, if not half, the fun. Cooking is experimentation in that it's all feel. I've heard you use that phrase to describe it, and I completely agree. Baking, though, is a slightly more regimented experiment. If you needed more salt in the, in the paella, you can't really go jot that down in a notepad while you're sautéing the steaming pan of rice and seafood in front of you. In baking, it's both more calm and more rigorous. You can write down exactly, you can keep track of, you can, it's very meticulous as well. You can be particular. You can keep track of exactly the changes you've made and exactly the effects it had. And you can think about exactly what you want to do next time. But how does it make you feel that you may do all of that? Two hours plus measure. Get on a scale that you bought. You picked out the ideal scale. Learn how to get, fun. It, get it down that to zero. That so crucial in my life. You did something called zeroing it out, which I didn't even mm -hmm. understand what that was. And you found the thing. And sometimes you'll just disappear into the kitchen while mom and I are watching the show. And then two hours later, the, the baked good comes out and it's not what you had in mind. What's your reaction? My reaction, there might be an initial fragment of slight disappointment. But my reaction is honestly more excitement because it means I can do all that again. I can spend another two hours saying, okay, I know exactly what this did, so this time I want to do this. And unless you burn it, that's really the worst thing that can happen in the kitchen. Unless you burn it, unless you burn something, it's still going to taste pretty good probably, even though it might not, had, might not have the effect and impact you're desired. So as we open the conversation about the search for being optimal, there's obviously experimentation towards a, a, a better result for whatever way you want to define mm. that. How is baking affected your relationship with optimization and, and perfection? Interesting. I would say it seems like it'll strengthen it because maybe not strengthen, but it definitely shows my desire for optimization. Like, According to, I believe, according to what you guys said, my last chocolate chip cookie that I made was, and I agree with this one, was by far the best I've ever made. It was, we, if, if this was a video, we would flash a picture on the screen and you might be amazed, viewer. I was amazed when this came out of the oven. I was so pleased with it. Best, best one I'd made, great texture, but I immediately said, my first reaction was, next time I'm going to do blank. And pretty much all three of my immediate family members individually looked at me like I was crazy and said, <laughs> no, this is amazing. This Why is would the you... one. This is the one, they said. Why would you make anything different? And I knew I could make it better. So why not? Why would I leave it at this when I can go further? And although it's sacrilegious to talk in depth about these cookies without having a listener being able to sample one. Oh, my, I feel terrible. It's important for me to mention with all candor, we're not talking about a dad and a mom saying, oh, Junior, that was great. That gets a good version mm. of a kid cookie. This was arguably the best chocolate chip cookie I've ever had in my life. 
Wow. And, and I really appreciate that clarification. Yeah, because I think people would would we, father son. Well, you did mm-hmm. good. The drawing's nice. Like this is something where you've That's... craved honest feedback. It's actually to a yeah. point. People should know this. You've asked for honesty from me in various aspects of your life in ways that have actually made me uncomfortable. Wow. I've had to push through my own limits of whether it's kindness or candor or being a parent versus being an evaluator in that role. You're asking me mm-hmm. at times, you have numerous times to put on an evaluator hat, which which people listening might not be comfortable with or maybe they'll be more comfortable with. I, I, I don't know if you've ever picked up on that, but then when you, you know, the, the cookie is kind of a metaphor, right? Like mm. we, you made cookies last night and they were oatmeal, basically they yeah, were I, Starbucks- I uh, what is it? Chai teas, latte, uh, fall, whatever in a, in a cookie. I called them oatmeal spice. I wanted to make an oatmeal cookie, but oatmeal raisin, I feel like would not be very well received in my house, even though I am kind of intrigued with it. So I threw in a bunch of fall spices that I thought of, and it turned out really great. For, for people who like those. So you put me in yes, a position indeed. last night where you were like, how is this? And I was just trying to be honest. And something you've helped me get grow at is, you know, the difference between truth and honesty and candor and the idea that mm-hmm. it's my experience that doesn't make it truth. So I said, mm-hmm. I don't enjoy these flavors. I don't want yeah. a Starbucks. I'm still searching for the right Pumpkin term. Pumpkin spice but latte. Bingo. <laughs> that was what it tasted like in a cookie. And I knew going in that that wasn't your favorite flavor profile. But, and I hate saying things like this, no offense, but the goal wasn't to make your perfect cookie. It wasn't, the goal wasn't to make a cookie that you'd enjoy. It was to make an enjoyable cookie. <laughs> Yeah, and I think listeners can pull out all kinds of beautiful lessons there. I want to talk briefly about praise and criticism. Um, Mm. It's an idea I think quite a lot about, whether it's with my students or with my children or myself, quite frankly. Um, We kind of hinted towards the idea of criticism. I had Will Gadara on the show, and you and I uh, and the rest of the family started watching The Bear, and we finished all up to season three. So you'll see Will from – you're well aware that Will's been on the show. Yeah, and I – at the time we were watching The Bear, it so beautifully coincided with my reading of Unreasonable Hospitality. And when I saw Will, there was so many layers of remembering him. First, he was on your show. Then he was in the book I was reading. And then he was in the show we were watching together. <laughs> but why did you read Un- Unreasonable Hospitality? Well, that was part of my search for food books. But even before slash around when my experimentation with baking first started... I was, I am still really, I was really searching for books on it. I wanted to learn, but not recipe books. Recipes are not what I needed or nor wanted. I wanted to find out why adding more flour does, gives you a, a thicker, drier cookie. I wanted to find out why more sugar gives you a thinner, crisper cookie. And I have, I've done a lot of diving into baking science all that to say, I was searching for baking and cooking books, and Unreasonable Hospitality was something that was a part of the restaurant industry. Though it wasn't exactly what I was looking for, it still proved to be an amazing read that will help me if I ever go into the restaurant industry and in other aspects of my life. But why not go out and play with a Frisbee like another 14-year-old? <laughs> well, that's putting it in pretty like <laughs> stereotypical terms, like you're, you're, you're making cookies, you're not playing football. But... The reason I'm not playing football, um, I don't know, just not not throwing a Frisbee, not playing baseball. I love to be outside and be active, but I really enjoy this kind of, as I said, the word I used earlier, introspective experimentation, mm-hmm. where it's like kind of solitary almost, where I can be in my mind cave thinking and dreaming up, imagining whatever I want rather than out. I don't want to make it sound like I enjoy being on my own rather than with other people. Both of them seriously have their merits. Yeah, I mean, you you appropriately corrected me a bit, a bit ago where you are out there in a, in a daily walk mm-hmm. and you actually walk. make it a walk run. Yeah. Right. So you are active. You're, you're much more active than me at this point. And, and mm-hmm. obviously taking a page out of mom's book. And um, so so it was it was a false binary. Right. To say that. But mm-hmm. but the point being, like, yeah, you, you do spend point. a lot of time in your head. 
Yeah. And I don't know that every teenager feels comfortable doing that. And you seem like you've always been comfortable with that. Mm hmm. And yeah, definitely. I love kind of exploring ideas and doing things in my head. And the fact that I love it doesn't make me feel guilty for it. It doesn't make me say like, dude, I should just be, I don't know, like I, I read books at home. And I've been told that that's, like, not something people do a lot. But I love to read. And it's not like I feel like I should stop. I love the stimulation I get. It's really fun for me. So that's a hobby just like throwing a football or hitting a baseball. How do you turn your mind off? That's interesting. Probably a sleep. <laughs> I, it's very hard for me to come up with a time where I would do that otherwise. And you at this point of your life have always had a very healthy regular sleep schedule which is mm -hmm. somewhat surprising for people because number one not to continue to paint a picture of you versus the typical teen but i think there mm -hmm. is some truth in that and you you stereotype a teen and you say stay up late sleep in late you've always been get up early sleep it relatively early yeah usually i recognize at night when i'm tired it's not like i'm trying to push myself to stay up when I'm tired, I'm all right, I go to sleep at night. And in the mornings, I relish waking up 5, 6 a.m. to get all the time I want and can out of the day. Hmm. I want to circle back to the praise and criticism piece because people listening now, whether you realize it or not, will be, they'll have questions. They'll be lobbing compliments my way via you. They'll be, impressed by a lot of the things you said and maybe there'll be some people that coach you up coach me up right mm -hmm. on, on on having this i haven't uh, recorded a conversation in quite some time so who knows how sharp i am <laughs> might be my first second one um the research from dweck and others is pretty clear that praising someone if you praise them for the wrong thing can have adverse effects mm -hmm. uh have you ever thought about that has that that has ever cross your mind and the reason I ask that is because because of the community member you are the human being you are mom and I we want to compliment you all the time but we're actually pretty well read educators where we know that complimenting you could potentially have adverse effects mm -hmm. to what extent have you ever thought about that piece as it relates to you and praise relates to me I have not thought about it a lot actually I of course have always valued honesty, as we touched on earlier. I always want you to be honest with your praise and criticism. Well, I've always wanted you to be honest with your criticism. I've never really thought about honesty with praise. And that might even, an honesty might mean complimenting me more than you want to, not to put words in your mouth. But that's interesting. I think about it with other people a lot, like the psychology of praise and criticism. I've heard that... I believe it came from Will Gadara, but I'm familiar with the phrase. I think it's praise is affirmation. Criticism is an investment. Mm. And I think about like the psychology of them both a lot with other people. Even I try to employ little tax tactics. Like if my friend's doing something that he thinks is really funny and I don't happen to enjoy it, I like look off to the side. I, I try and like almost pointedly not show praise. So maybe they mentally say, oh, wait a minute, that's not getting a reaction. I should do something else. So using the Gadara principle, the praise and, and, and criticism matrix, how have mom and dad done for you in terms of managing that? Wow. This is a hard question. It's like asking. It's like. Yeah, asking the praisee to think outward rather than the praiser to think about the ones giving it. Never seen it considered from this perspective. I'll add a little color while you while you ponder it. Um, a very simple thing for me to say is, and anyone listening could say the same thing, Joey, you're so smart. Hmm. Right? You have good grades in school. You have a good vocabulary. You are every bit as well-spoken as most guests I've had on in 300 episodes. Praising your intelligence is praising your nature and something that you mm -hmm. were quote-unquote given by God, by parents, by genes, by whatever. Mm -hmm. It would really, according to the research, and I believe this, it would then 
strike down the amount of work you've put in in 14 years, the actual reading that you've done. You've read more books in 14 years than most people that I know. You've thought more than any teenager I know. So that's kind of what I'm interested in is this idea that like, I never want to say, oh, my son is smart. My son is, I, I have no problem saying my son is kind, but I wouldn't be lazy and say he's smart because it doesn't cover that processes that you've put into place, if that makes sense. Interesting. That's a testament to wording being important, I guess, because there are differences maybe with like smart and wise and intelligent. So I I definitely... I love to be praised. I mean, like, scratch that. Hmm. Everyone does. But I appreciate a good compliment. That doesn't mean it's tough to say this because it's like I don't want to renounce compliments because I do like them. But I definitely don't want to be complimented to the point where it's watered down. It's tough to do actually do this. But I, w- I want to be complimented to the point where it's still special, but I still know that I'm appreciated if I'm appreciated. Mm. One of the things you do so much of is be thoughtful. Mm. A week ago, I helped uh, your grandparents just get around a little bit at a soccer game. And then later that day, you told me, hey, you know you're a good son-in-law, right? I remember. That's not... That's not a typical behavior, right? Even mm-hmm. even if a typical teen would think that, they to take to go the extra mile and either text it to me, which you've done many times, or pull me aside and say that. Where does that come from? This kind of goes hand in hand with my I'll go back a sec. So I get a lot of questions similar to this, and I I pretty much have decided on an answer. I love to feel good. I've been lucky with a lot of people in my life that make me feel really good about who I am, how I am, and even just like I enjoy time with them. And and so I want to do... And so in life, I try to do everything I can to give others that same experience. I love to feel happy, so why wouldn't I try and gift it to someone else? And what are some of the ways that you frequently try to give that happiness to others? I'm big on empathy. Empathy is one of my favorite things to exercise, just considering all points of view. I try never to really be angry or forceful or mean. I've been working on a lot of different ways to demonstrate displeasure and like, ask people to change their behavior or something. I want to make them feel safe. I want to make them feel like I'm on their team. Hmm. We record this with you entering high school Mm -hmm. a couple months in. Dun dun. Where are you in your mind in five years? That's a big question. My thought right now is that I'll go to college simply because... Mostly because I can't, ima- it's, it's hard to imagine a life without school. School, as much as we try to downplay it and do other things, school is a teenager's life. That's where you are, like, eight to three every day, minus two of them out of the week. That's where you spend the majority of your time. It's shaping you. Literally, that is the thing that is meant to shape you into an adult so picturing my days without some place to go and learn is a little daunting it's it's just as daunting as picturing college Mm. but let me paint you some alternate realities one is you're working with your grandfather in his restaurant Mm, another is certainly has merit you're in france uh on a grant program studying at the best bakeries in france that would be, that sounds absolutely lovely. Would a grant program, isn't that a college thing though? It could be. There's, I mean, there's you, um, and to be honest, your sister have done so many things that um, impress mom and I that we start thinking about these things, whether it's a 
small school for individual attention? Is it a school with a huge name and a huge endowment to, to challenge you academically? Is it something where you get international experience in? Is there things where you, you've heard me say to you, would you be interested in a private high school? Um, full mm -hmm. disclosure, we've been thrilled with the high school that you're at. It was one of two high schools that you oh, applied wow. to. And, mm -hmm. um, and I think, you know, even there showing different interests. And we've always said, hey, if you wanted to try a private school, that'd be interesting. But I think you've had a great experience so far in a couple of months. Like it's just, these are things that we, as we search for optimization, as we search for betterment, as we search for getting better, these are conversations mom and I are always having, and we just sometimes wonder. So I, I, there's no question in there. I just wanted to throw that back at you and see if anything's Aww. stuck. Well, I, I do like the notion, since I'm, I, since I'm big on there's no one way to do things, you can deviate from the norm if it gets you a better result or makes you happy. From that school of thought, I do like the notion that there are other places to go than college. But I go back to, like, that's an entirely different life and lifestyle. So. And when you think of college, are you immediately thinking, well, if I'm going to go to college, I should go to a great one. So I'm going to go to Harvard. I'm going to go to the best school. I'm going to go to Yale, the best school in Connecticut. Or, or do you think of best differently? Do you, how do you think about that whole thing? Gosh. I haven't put a lot of thought into what college I'd go to. Some of my friends, you have the occasional person where it comes up in math class and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm going to Berkeley or something random like that. I've never gotten to that position. It's, I'll give you an example of something like the Culinary Institute of America. I don't know if that constitutes as college, but based on my interests right now, like, I'm taking a culinary arts class in school. In fact, we have our first lab assignment in the kitchen on Monday, which is tomorrow, and I'm very excited for that. If you're telling me I can go to school totally for that, to learn hone skills in the kitchen, that sounds like exactly what I'd want to do. Mm. Let me throw this at you and see how this reacts to you and how you react to it. I, I used to play a lot of poker, as you probably remember. Indeed, yeah. And... uh Actually, we, you and I have talked briefly about maybe you learning how to play poker. I would be afraid of the gambling part <laughs> of it, but I, the psychology part of it and the human mm -hmm. reading and the economics, we can talk about another time. But I was uh, playing against the gentleman, and he was very good, and I kept being impressed by how much he played and how well he played. I would see him all the time, and he was always winning, and I was pretty new to the game, and I went up to him, and I said, Sir, i got to tell you, you are a great poker player. And he's like, Oh, thank you. I really like it. I said, Have you ever thought about doing this professionally? And he just looked at me, and I'll never forget what he said. He said, if I did this for a job, what would I do for fun? Mm, that's a great... That's something I've heard about baking, too. That's a really great point. I've read things, of course, about baking, like I'm having so much fun with it. If I go into it for work, it could ruin it. It could turn it pressurized. It could give me expectations that I might not be ready to meet all that sort of things. So I really like that point of view. It's something to think about. It's something to look at. It's not necessarily prescriptive, um, but definitely mm. something to think about. Fortunately, I'm, it, I'm in the same position regarding that as I am with college. I don't have to make a decision <laughs> yet. I can keep baking. I've been trying to do every week, trying out a new recipe and I can keep exceeding I can I can keep trying in my studies at school and I don't have to commit to a college I don't have to commit to a career. Totally. And and I think, you know, earlier when we mentioned you watching The Bear, full disclosure, that was a tough decision for me to make. Mm. To quote unquote allow you to watch The Bear. Now, some people will say, well, he's going to find it on his own, but that's not really your personality type. You have never been at least to my mind, unless you want to break news here, a rebel. <laughs> you haven't been someone doing things below board everything you've done has been in a, in a candid conversation with us hmm. i'd say i wouldn't call me a rebel in the sense I, I do like defying norms but yeah i wouldn't like deliberately do that to get to someone yeah like we wouldn't say don't watch the bear please and then you're we found out you watch the bear on your ipad or something like that hmm. wouldn't be a personality trait for no. you. no reason i bring that up is it has a lot of profanity and mm. we don't really use a lot of profanity at home so when that was yeah. coming at you with just f-bomb after f-bomb we justified, 
I, again, I don't like the word because we give you a lot of free choice, probably more than most teens have in some weird ways and, and others probably more restrictions, mm. but allowing you to watch it with us and, and the same, your sister as well, who's younger than you, we basically said language is a tool. We, this is a justification we made. Your parents are both writers and communicators. Mm -hmm. um, language is a tool. Without the F-bombs, it wouldn't be a realistic show because those are pressurized kitchens. You're extremely interested in the culinary word world. Let's do it. Um, whereas we might put boundaries on other things that have either a different type of content or violence or things like that. Mm -hmm. So I, I'm just, I guess I, I wanted to frame that to say like, that's one of the measures we've taken to try to keep you a kid. <laughs> because we always say like, you're a kid a lot longer than, you're an adult a lot longer than you're a kid. Once you're an adult, there's no going back. Definitely true. So that's something we think about. And with that in mind, I want to ask you in, in towards the last section of our conversation, um, I'd be remiss not to tap into you who's been a ringside seat to episodes one through 300 to some degree. I mean, maybe you don't remember one, but you certainly have seen a lot of the evolution of this podcast, um, quite literally mm -hmm. sitting next to me on the couch many times, yeah. whether I'm playing back a clip from a guest or whether I'm asking you for a strategy on how to talk to a client, which mm -hmm. clients, if you're listening, it's, it's okay, I promise. Um, I would hope you could trust me. <laughs> what's your broad level view of what you've seen from your father as I've tried to approach this project, passion, business, whatever you, you may have? I certainly have been a part of many car conversations while we're driving on an errand together, couch conversations in the morning, anywhere you could think of. I, I just, I remember you discussing how you discussing the conversations you have with people to help them in so many different ways. That's around what you do. You help people through conversations, whether it be literally improving their skills at them or giving them a damn good one to enjoy and to make them think about something. And you yourself get some out of it too. You get a nice conversation where you can think about whatever your guest tells you. I appreciate that. How many times mm -hmm. have you thought to yourself, man, this is a lot of work. I wish he would take some time off. Uh, I wish he would spend more time with me and my sister. Hey. Uh, can't we not do another podcast? Does it always have to be Joey podcast? How often is that type <laughs> Meaning of Meaning you, Joey Podcast, not me, Joey Podcast. <laughs> exactly. How often has that line of thinking crossed your mind? Wow. Well, not not to the extent, not to a, not to a high extent, but there certainly have been times in my life where I'm coming downstairs or I've been downstairs from bed and I'm ready for you to get down so we can crank into some cooking videos on the TV or learn a new topic or... I can tell you about my latest cookie endeavor and you come down and get seated with your laptop on your latest consulting work. And it's like, dang, but I definitely don't feel neglected. We've always had time together and it manifests itself, it manifests itself in lots of different ways. So. Yeah, I appreciate that. I, I think people listening, sometimes one of my, whether it's skills or approaches to conversation is to try to anticipate what somebody listening would want to know. That's one of my mm -hmm. question asking frameworks. So I think at this moment I'm, I'm compelled to ask, would you ever consider going into the podcast work? I would say no. It's, it's like you've asked me the same question about teaching, which is another thing you do. <laughs> I, I have never felt I've been watching you, and I'm I'm impressed with the amount of sheer initiative you've taken and effort you've put in to help all these people and further your productivity and business and all that. And with teaching, I so admire the impact you're having on students. But neither one have I felt, I would love this. I want this to be my life. Nothing about that has said it to me, and that's fine. I'm... I'm glad that they have for you. It, so we played the over under game this summer, like trying to get into a mm. gambling light, if you will. Like we're just like human predictions where <laughs> it's like, do I, will I eat more than one and a half burritos on the trip to San Diego and kind of introducing 
concepts like that. Um, so if you were gambling on your future right now, you would bet that you would do what as a living? That's a loaded one. I have a lot of pauses here after you asking me questions. You're just so good. I gotta. It takes me a second to process. I, I, I when I started this journey, people would say, you know, should we edit out the pauses? And I don't know if you remember this specifically, but I I left in Mitch album pausing for eight seconds after I asked him a question, and I wow. never edited. I was tempted to because eight seconds. I mean, let's do three seconds of silence just to show people how long three seconds is. Eight seconds of Mitch Album, and he's one of the smartest writers in the world. So you get that idea that like, it's, it's a sign of a good question. Yeah, I kind of like that you leave them in. Maybe not every time, but <laughs> I like that little testament to your strength. That being said, are you saying I'm a baker? If I if I had to predict right now, I would say food. I would say food writer. I would honestly say that I would write about, I would try different baked goods. Maybe I would write about the things that I'm making or about other, or about the other people's creations, both kind of interspersed with cooking and baking worlds, sweet and savory. I've also heard you talk about psychology. Yeah, that's something I, I want to study. Simply, I don't know if people do this, but that's something I want to study simply because I'm interested in it. I'm curious <laughs> as to why people do what they do, why they think how they think, but it's not something I want to do for a living. Uh, I'm laughing, and I apologize for if I interrupted no, your please. Of thought there. I, I'm laughing because you said, you asked, I'm not sure if that's what people do. And in a sense, that's the purest form of why we should study something, right? Mm. If you think about it, Will, uh, William DeRezowitz, early into the podcast journey, he had this long conversation about what is college for, and it, it, he ultimately comes down to, he thinks it's number one to, to teach you how to think, to give you the space and conditions and tools to think. That's what he thinks college is for. And we can go back and forth. Interesting, sounds very important. Yeah, but if you think about it, like you said, and I, and I have to go back and rewind that and, and pull that clip, but like, I don't know if this is what people do, but I want to study it because I'm interested. There's nothing more pure. And with someone with your rigor that you apply to it, that's to me, that's what mom and I want for you, right? To find something you genuinely enjoy and never one time say, I hope I can make money in this. Anyone listening to this will basically agree that you pick something and you do the Joey way towards it, and that's going to lead to success, or you're going to pivot, or you're going to mm -hmm. redefine success. And I, I know that is in your future, whatever it is. Man, thank you. Is there a guest uh, on the podcast that you would like to meet? Someone that I've interviewed, um, that you've watched and admired, that you, if I could put you in touch with them, you would love to talk to them. Interesting. I usually balk at these, for lack of a better word, balk at these kind of questions because although I may admire someone, that doesn't necessarily mean that I want to have a conversation with them. Like, I like their work. Will Gadara comes to mind because he's someone whose content I've enjoyed and both content and his insights. But I couldn't think of a reason I'd need to sit down <laughs> with him. I, I love that because that's precisely how I view the podcast. I say I enjoy this person's work and I want to have a conversation with them. And you said that mm -hmm. the opposite is more often true for you. Yeah. That, that's not a bad thing. Maybe that coincides with why... I'm not thinking of going into the podcast industry. Hmm. So we've talked about the future. We've looked ahead, and, and sometimes that's healthy and sometimes it's not. But I want to close with us in the present. Uh, mm. We're here arm in arm on the couch looking at a beautiful house that we help maintain and enjoy and really just get the best out of. I don't know if this is supposed to be on the air, but we do happen to be in the basement, the most cluttered area, and yet it's still beautiful. <laughs> Yeah, for another conversation, there's probably some talk about clutter and minimalism and, and indulgence and luxuries and, and just truly just, if I'm being honest, just privilege that we do have. There are people more privileged than us and certainly, certainly many, many people less privileged than us. And I think we appreciate that. I, I know I tell you I love you every single day. I want to tell you on the air. Yeah, despite all this stuff, the most privileged we are is having each other. Yeah, and we really have fun. We, we do a lot of things. Yeah. 
together. We bring your sister into the mix. Mommy, who I've nicknamed the architect, is always leading the way with her vision for where we should go. Don't I know it. And uh, I want to close with, with ninth grade. You are a, a high school mm-hmm. student. When I say, what type of things do you have in mind that are maybe in progress or something to look forward to in the present? What are you looking forward to? What, do you, what has your attention and your excitement in your ninth grade year? Interesting. Well, the class itself, I'll say, that I'm most excited about is culinary arts. I actually heard a student today at my high school say, do we have a cooking class? Do you? No. And it gave me a chance to kind of brag about the education you're getting. And if I'm not mistaken, (laughs) this is a class that has ninth through 12th graders in the class. Yeah. And I know that you found yourself following in the footsteps of some of the older people and leading some of the older people because... Do my best. Yeah. One of the things that I think is important to mention is that you are a connector. You are someone Mm -hmm. who just as easily is able to talk to older people as people your age. In fact... You're coming off the heels of a homecoming dance. Indeed. And that was so cool because we were traveling and it wasn't going to be the easiest thing to get there. And all the things said, hey, not necessarily uh, every ninth grader is going to go. And yet you knew there was a small group that was going to go. And that was an experience you wanted to jump into. Yeah, there were 17 total freshmen there, but I don't regret it for a second. It was a really fun time. And it plugged me in a little more to the high school social life. Yeah. And it makes me and mom so proud. It's like, let's jump in. Let's be present. Let's try things. You've gotten some of your community service hours done that involves pets. Mm-hmm. Not a lot, but it was a great five hours. <laughs> Not a lot for people listening. I think it's, is it 50 hours you need to do? Yeah. When you think about it from the perspective of 10%, it sounds like a lot, but you know, I can keep making some strides. 10% in the early stages of October. Not too shabby. What else has your attention? I like human geography. I'm taking (laughs) AP Human Geo. It's been a pretty popular class with my classmates, actually. It's really cool how everyone recognizes that it's like a hard class. It's AP. We're all taking our first AP. But everyone feels like it's really cool what we're actually learning, and I totally agree. Yeah, and not an accident that you're in that class and it's part of a community that's building. That's something that you do. It's something that we we are admired by. You, you're you're side by side with friends of whatever age. You've led with kindness, and we just couldn't be more proud. Dang, dude! I thank you so much for the the togetherness we've had our whole life. Your effects on me, my effects on you. I wouldn't change a thing, man. When I was talking with mom about this, she had kind of gently asked me to ask you, mm-hmm. would you sign up to do this again in a few years to kind of timestamp it? Wow. Well, what did I say the last time I was on here? I don't remember. I remember you doing a beautiful oh. intro and saying, speaking directly to the audience. Really? I like that. Well, I'll, I'll speak to you then again, listener. We'll see how you guys feel. We'll see how I did. And I would love to come back for another milestone. Yeah. And I think I appreciate that. That's about as close as a commitment we can get on air binding wise. So I appreciate (laughs) that. But what I will say is that this is a, (laughs) this is a show that I launched July 1st, 2017 under the premise that it's fun to have conversations. It's part of a lifelong learning process. It's a timestamp, and I can't tell you in that time since 2017 how many people I've invited to share conversations like this with a loved one. It doesn't have to be a Wall Street Journal bestselling author, which I've been lucky enough to have. It can be a friend. It can be the guy from the, the hardware store. It could be the woman from the auto body shop. I'd watch S- both of those episodes. Right. Something happens, and you probably experienced it today. Something happens when you put the headphones on, when you sit down in one place, when you speak into a microphone. It's not that it's performative, but it, I've tried to tell people it's, it's heightened. There's a, there's a heightened energy, at least how I experience it. There's a heightened presence. You feel like you're here, not there. Yeah, and you're just tethered together in a moment of connection, sharing words and thoughts. And with that, it's a great place to close. You know, I'll speak to the listener and I'll say, if you enjoyed this, know that it's within your grasp. It's not because Joey and I love having conversations. We do. 
It's not because we try to find the right words. We do. It's not that we smiled all the way through this. We have. Take the next step. Uh, reach out. Let us know how it went. Tell us how the, your conversation with your mother went. Tell us what you did with mm. this inspiration. The quest to get 1% better after 300 episodes is taking small, sustainable steps forward in the worlds of mindset, language, and communication. And uh, it's just an amazing journey. Thank you so much for doing this with me. Thank you for starting it and for having me on, just giving me these little peek throughs into your world. He's Joey. I'm Joe. Thank you so much for being here. Some of you since episode one with many more to come. On that note, I appreciate you being here and I'll see you soon for another damn good conversation. I hope you enjoyed. I'd like to say goodbye to my friend Darsh. Have a great day. I hope you enjoyed this episode. That wasn't sanctioned. <laughs> we'll see if it makes it in. Love you, man. This is the 1% Better Podcast.